All right, hello and welcome back. <clears throat> I'm here in this natural setting to uh, help you work on deductive proofs. So uh, for many students, this is a challenging step. It can also be quite fun once you get the hang of it. Uh, I introduced the basic method for doing proofs when I introduced the rules of inference in a previous lecture. Um, but this is a challenge in an online class, right? Uh, being able to uh, get over the sort of initial hump of like, what the heck am I even doing here, right? So <clears throat> I'm gonna try to walk you through again. We're just going to practice doing some proofs. I'd also recommend, you know, helping each other out in the discussion board. Uh, this is a great uh, opportunity to use that uh, in order to, for those of you for whom it was clicking, it clicks at different times for different people. And if it's clicking for you, uh, help folks out in the discussion board to get them over that hump. And if it's not clicking for you, post questions. Um, of course, always come to office hours as well. Send me emails. Um, stay engaged with this, right? Because <clears throat> Um, you can't just sort of ignore it and hope it goes away. So <clears throat> we have the basic tools now to assess deductive arguments for validity, right? So we get an argument just in English. We can break it down into, we can find the conclusion, we can find the premises. Then we can translate each of those statements into our logical language. And then we can use a proof to show that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true, right? Um, now recall, this method won't prove that the argument is invalid, right? So again, what we're gonna be trying to do is once we've translated it, we've got our premises and we're gonna say, can we, using only valid rules of inference, right, get to the conclusion? Can we deduce the conclusion, produce it using only these rules? Now, if we can't do it, you're never quite sure if you just weren't clever enough, right, to do the proof or if such a proof doesn't exist, right? So remember we had the, Kind of inverse situation with our counterexample method. Our counterexample method was if we can come up with a counterexample, we've definitely shown the argument to be invalid, but we could never know if it was valid because maybe we just weren't clever enough to come up with a counterexample. Here, if we can do the proof, we know it's valid, um, but if we can't do the proof, <clears throat> um, maybe we just weren't clever enough, right? But between the two, you have um, good methods for checking arguments for invalidity and for validity, right? So, <clears throat> Let's uh, move on to uh, some proofs. So here is an argument. It's a common argument that you might find in a philosophy class or even among folks who are, you know, interested in issues of uh, metaphysics and whether God exists. This is a, a common argument against the existence of God. Um, we're going to check it for validity first, and then we'll see if it's sound, right? And at the end of this, we'll, we'll decide whether, um, you know, we should stop believing in God or whether uh, the argument possibly fails on, on one of these two points. So the argument goes like this. If God exists, then God is all good and all powerful. That's just the definition of God, right? If God is all good and all powerful, he would prevent evil. If evil exists, then God does not prevent evil. Evil does exist, therefore God does not exist. So that's the argument. Um, first, we wanna to try to find the conclusion, right? Uh, do we have any conclusion indicators? Any words that say, here comes the conclusion? Well, yes, we do. Therefore, right? That is a conclusion indicator. So the conclusion must be God does not exist. So that means that everything else is going to be a premise. So how many premises are there? Uh, I see four, right? Basically, every other statement besides the conclusion is going to be a premise. So let's number them, right? So the first statement, right, is if God exists, then God is all good and all powerful. That's our first premise. Second, we have if God is all good and all powerful, he would prevent evil, second premise. Three, if evil exists, God does not prevent evil, and evil exists, right? So those are our four premises, and the conclusion is God does not exist. So now we've found our conclusion, we found our premises, and we've numbered them, right? So that's step one. Now we need to translate these into our logical language. All right, so now that we've found our conclusion and our premises, we need to translate the argument. So, here we've got one, two, three, four premises and our conclusion. So <clears throat> let's look at our first one. What uh, sort of statement are we dealing with? What's the main operator? Uh, first of all, it looks like it's a compound statement, right? Because we've got an if, pardon me, I had to sneeze there. I think I'm among some trees that uh, I'm allergic to, but I do enjoy the natural setting. So <clears throat> first statement, what is the main operator? It looks like it's a compound statement because we've got an if we've also got an and right so this is definitely not atomic but the question is what is the main operator 
for statement one, right, for the first premise. Well, let's look to the comma, right? The comma usually gives us a hint, and we have a comma here. It looks like the comma is right before a then, right? And <clears throat> on the far left, we've got an if. It looks like this statement is a conditional statement, right? It breaks in half, right, before the consequent, right? So we're dealing with a <clears throat> conditional. I would say God exists is the antecedent, right? The part before the comma between the if and the comma. And then after the then, we've got the consequent. Now the consequent is itself a compound statement, right? God is all benevolent and all powerful. <clears throat> so I went ahead and translated that consequent as a conjunction, and I ended up with something like this. If G, then in parentheses, B and B. <clears throat> the second statement, follows the same uh, sort of format. It also looks to be a conditional, right? We've got a comma that breaks it in half. Right after the comma is a then, right? So I think every everything between the if and the comma is going to be antecedent. Here the antecedent is God is all benevolent and all powerful. Well, look, that is actually the same as the consequent of one, right? So I put that in parentheses, B and P. And then what's the consequent of the second premise? Well, it's the part after the then, it's he would stop evil, right? So it looks like we've got a conditional in the second premise where the antecedent is a conjunction and the consequent is just atomic, he would stop evil. So I've assigned S to he would stop evil. <clears throat> Number three, also a conditional, right? We've got a lot of conditionals in this argument. If evil exists, comma, God does not stop evil. Now in three, we didn't get the then, right? It's nice when we have a then, but we had the if starting the whole sentence, we had a comma that breaks it into two. That's enough for me to say this is probably conditional as well, right? So the antecedent of three is evil exists, right? Everything between the if and the comma, I'll call that E. And then the consequent is actually a uh, compound as well. It's a negation, right? So God does not stop evil is the negation of God does stop evil. So I would call that not S, right? Because we already have God will stop evil in premise two as the consequent there. And then premise four is just atomic, evil exists, right? There's no ands or ors or ifs in that. Um, and we already have E as evil exists. And so then the conclusion, God does not exist, that is compound. Sometimes people find that tricky, right? Because there is a little negation in there. So it's the negation of God does exist, right? So here's how I've translated this argument. Um, G stands for God exists. B stands for God is all benevolent. P stands for God is all powerful. Uh, S stands for God would stop evil. And E stands for evil exists. All right, so now we have got our argument translated here. We've got our four premises. <clears throat> We've got our conclusion. Um, now the question is, can we derive the conclusion from the premises using only our valid rules of inference. Now, remember our rules are for conditionals, modus ponens and modus tollens, MP and MT, right? For conjunctions, we've got conjunction introduction, CI and simplification, S. For disjunctions, we've got disjunctive syllogism, DS and addition. Um, and for, we've got also got double negation and biconditional, right? So hopefully you have at this point a little cheat sheet of all your rules, right? So you can kind of look at them. Eventually, you need to get those like in your brain, and then you'll just be doing proofs without checking your rules. But it's okay to have your list of rules next to you while you're learning to do proofs. So let's strategize here. Um, let's look at the conclusion. So the conclusion is not G, right? Um, so not G doesn't appear in any of the premises, but G appears in some of the premises. And we know that some of our rules will end up negating something and then spitting it out on its own, right? So uh, if I'm going to get not G, it's going to have to come from premise one somehow, right? And uh, do we have a rule then that would leave us at the end of it with a negation of the antecedent of a conditional, right? Because G is sitting there as the antecedent of a conditional, but we'd like to get it on its own. We'd like to get it negated. Well, we do have a rule that does that for us. It's modus tollens, right? MT. Um, MT does give us the negation of the antecedent of a conditional. What we need, though, to feed into it, right, the other premise we would need would be the negation of the consequent of one. So that would be not 
B and P. Um, so could we get not B and P? Well, <clears throat> we'll keep working backwards, right? We can put that on our wish list, right? If only we had not B and P, right? We'd be done with a with an MT, but we don't have it. So how could we get it? Well, again, um, <clears throat> the only other place B and P shows up is in premise two. And notice there it also shows up as the antecedent of a conditional. So once again, we're in the situation where we'd love to get the antecedent of a conditional on its own and negated. Well, we already said the rule that lets us do that is MT, right? But then what would we need? What other premise would we need? We would need the negation of the consequent, and that's not S. So now we're moving up our wish list, right? We're like, we're saying, man, if only we had not B and P, uh, we could get not G. And if only we had not S, we could get not B and P. So would there be a way to get not S? Well, not S does show up in line three, right? There it's the consequent and it's already negated, right? So we just need to pull that consequent out and just get it on its own. Um, well, there's a rule that lets us do that. It's MP, right? The other premise we would need is the antecedent on its own. We would need E on its own. Well, we are in luck, right? <clears throat> we have E on its own. So we've just strategized backwards, right? Oh, in order to get the conclusion, we need this. In order to get that, we'd need this, and then we'd need this. And now we've ended up with something we actually have, right? We actually have E, so we can get the whole process started now. <clears throat> so my first move would be three and four MP, right? I can conclude not S on line five. Then, now that I have line S, right, I can feed that into line two and spit out the negation of B and P. And I would say that's two, five, MT, right? So when you do your proofs, it should look exactly like this. You, you write, right, a new um, uh, statement that you're able to derive. And then over on the right, you write your justification for how you were allowed to write that statement, right? It would be the rule and then however many premises are required for that rule. MP and MT require two premises, right? Not everything does. Simplification only requires one premise. In that case, you'd only write one one number premise number there. So next, I want not G, right? That was the whole reason I wanted not B and P to do another MT. So um, I can derive not G on line seven from line one and line six MT. And that was our conclusion, right? So the argument is valid, right? We can derive God does not exist validly from those premises. But that doesn't guarantee that the argument is a good one, right? Remember, a good deductive argument has two ingredients. It needs to be valid, but it also needs to be sound, meaning the premises have to be true. So now the question is, are all these premises true? If so, we, we're going to have to stop, stop believing in God, right? <clears throat> um, well, oh, I didn't put it on the slides, but the premise people usually attack, right, is uh, premise that says, if God is all good and powerful, then he would prevent evil, right? Some people disagree with that. They say, no, even though God is all good and all powerful, uh, he still doesn't necessarily prevent evil because he wants people to have free will, right? He wants us to be allowed to do evil if we choose. Otherwise, he's just got little robots running around. And what's the point of that? So it is a valid argument, but many people would argue it's not a sound argument because that premise is false. And therefore, um, if you want to believe in God, you can continue to believe in God. Okay, let's look at another argument. Let's try to translate it, then prove it, right? It says, look, either you're tough on crime or you're a communist. If you're a communist, then you're a traitor and you belong in jail. If you favor legalizing marijuana, you are not tough on crime and you favor legalizing marijuana, you belong in jail. So first task here is to find our conclusion, right? And we don't have any conclusion indicators. We don't have a therefore or a so. What are we gonna do? Well. Uh, we just have to sort of look at the argument and think, well, what is the point, right? You have to sometimes just use context and our own understanding of English and how people have conversations, right? And it looks like the point they're making, and it, often it's the last point, though not always, you belong in jail, right? That seems to be the conclusion that they're trying to drive home, right? We don't have a conclusion indicator. We have to just use common sense. Um, you belong in jail. That's the conclusion, right? So what are the premises? Well, it's every other statement in the argument. One, either you're tough on crime or you're a communist. Two, if you're a communist, you're a traitor and you belong in jail. Three, 
If you favor legalizing marijuana, you are not tough on crime. And four, you favor legalizing marijuana. So those are the premises, right? Those are the reasons they give us for the conclusion you belong in jail. So here's how I would translate this. Let's walk through it step by step, right? So premise one, what is the main operator here? Well, the only uh, statement operators I see are either or, right? Disjunction. I don't see any nots. I don't see any ifs. I don't see any ands. So that simplifies things. It's a compound statement, but it's just a disjunction and there's just, you know, two disjuncts that are atomic. So the left disjunct would be you are tough on crime, right? And the right disjunct would be you are a communist. So I would translate statement one as T or C. Again, you can choose whatever letters you want, right? Um, these are just the ones I'm choosing. Okay, so <clears throat> premise two, if you're a communist, then you are a traitor and you belong in jail. Uh, how would I translate this statement? Well, it's definitely compound, right? I've got, I see an if, I see an and. So the question is, what's the main operator of two? Thankfully, we have a comma here. It says comma then, right? It's looking like a conditional, right? So uh, let's break that in half at the comma. What's the antecedent? Well, it's the part between the if and the comma. You are a communist. Now we already have you are a communist as the right disjunct of one, so just make sure you assign the same sentence letter to you are a communist on both lines, right? So that's C. What's the consequent of two? Well, it's everything after the then, so it's you are a traitor and you belong in jail. Now that is also compound, right? We've got an and in it, so we need to break that up uh, and make that a conjunction, right? So we end up with if C, then R and J on line two. So, <clears throat> Premise three, if you favor legalizing marijuana, you are not tough on crime. What's the main operator here? Again, looking like a conditional, right? We've got the comma. Uh, we don't have the then, right? We have an if at the beginning of the sentence. So I'm thinking conditional. So that means the antecedent will be everything between the if and the comma. You favor legalizing marijuana, right? So that's a new atomic statement. We'll call it L. And then the consequent, everything after the comma, you are not tough on crime. So that is compound, that's a negation, right? So it's the negation of you are tough on crime. Uh, you are tough on crime, notice we already have that atomic statement that shows up in premise one, so we'll call that not T, right? So three is if L, then not T. And then finally, uh, our last premise, you favor legalizing marijuana, that is atomic, right? I don't see any ands or ifs or ors in it. So, uh, and we already have that atomic statement is the antecedent of three, so we'll call that L. And then our conclusion is also atomic, right? You belong in jail, um, we'll call it J. So we've translated this argument. Again, you know, we've already practiced a lot of translating statements, so hopefully this is familiar at this point. We're just doing it in the context of translating an entire argument. Um, but if you need to review that, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me, uh, reach out in the discussion, um, and so on, right? But hopefully this, the translating part should feel like you're getting used to you know, being able to do it. Okay, so how would we solve this, right? Um, now, there's really two ways to strategize. You can kind of, in the last proof, right, the one about the existence of God, we kind of worked bottom up, right? We started with the conclusion and we looked, okay, where could the conclusion show up in the premise? What would I need to get it out? Um, and then what would I need to get that thing that I needed? And so on and backwards, right? Um, you can also go top down and sometimes you switch between the two. If you kind of get stuck strategizing backwards, take a break and just look at your premises and see, can I make any moves, right? And once you've gotten familiar enough with your rules of inference, um, certain moves will start to pop out at you, right? So hopefully pretty soon, if you look at premises three and four, you'll start to see an opportunity to do a MP there, right? You've got a conditional on line three, you've got the antecedent of the conditional by itself on line four, <laughs> that should look like an opportunity to do an M MP. Pardon me. <clears throat> and if you see such an opportunity, just do it. Um, if it turns out not being useful, that's fine, right? There's no extra points for doing the most elegant or shortest proof. So every time you see an opportunity to use a rule, just do it, right? You don't have to have a goal in mind. Sometimes the the answer will appear as you just apply the rules. So you could write on line five, just write not T, three, four MP. See if that helps you out with anything. You might at that point notice, oh, it might actually 
help me do a DS with line one, right? I've got T or C, and if I have not T written on line five, I could do a DS and get C on its own, and it all might, the dominoes might roll that way, right? <clears throat> but let's back up and let's try working it backwards, strategizing. So uh, we're looking for J, that's our conclusion, right? Well, where does J appear? It appears in line two there, kind of tucked away inside a conjunction, inside the consequent of a conditional. So looks like it's going to be a lot of work to get J on its own, right? Um, uh, but, you know, actually, if we can just get R and J on its own, we know breaking up a conjunction is pretty easy. That's just the simplification rule. So really, the hard part is getting that conjunction on its own. We need uh, to do a modus ponens, right, to spit out the consequent of two. So we would need C, right? Okay, so where could we get C? <clears throat> well, the only place C shows up is in line one. It's tied up in a disjunction there, right? Uh, but we can break up disjunctions. We have a rule that does it, DS, right? So if only we had not T, right? If we could cancel out one of the disjuncts, we could get C on its own. And as we just described, right? Oh, yeah. If I was just looking at the premises and noticing a opportunity for an MP with three and four, I would already have not T written on line five. And so our top down and our bottom up strategies will meet in the middle often at some point, right? So here's how I would, here's how I would do uh, this proof, right? So again, one through four is what we had and we're trying to get to J. So I would do three, four MP, that gets me not T on its own. Then I would do one and five DS, and that gets me C on its own. And line seven, right? I would then use C to get R and J on, on their own with an MP, line two, six. And now that I've got R and J, it's easy to just get J with simplification right, on line eight. Now, um, there's sort of two stages to figuring out how to do a proof. At the first stage, you might watch me do this and think, I don't think I could ever like see those moves and how to make them right. That's fine at this stage if you're not there yet. But what I would like to at least for you to do is to be able to look at like line five and understand why what's written there is written there, right? Be able to see line five and see, oh, I see you were allowed to write not T, right? Because you did modus ponens with three and four. And be sh I, I want you to at least be able to do that with each line that I wrote there, understand what I wrote and why I wrote it, right? If you're not even there yet, you need to practice with your rules of inference. Once you're there, then, you know, you you will eventually make the leap to seeing how to solve it, you know, without me walking you through it, but at least understand what I'm doing when I walk you through it. That's a necessary stage. Okay, here's a, another argument, right? If you are guilty of speeding, I'll have to give you a ticket. If you are guilty, you will blink your eyes. You just blink your eyes, so I have to give you a ticket. Okay, so is this a valid argument is the question, right? Well, we can uh, first find the conclusion. Here we have a so, right, a conclusion indicator, so that's nice. The conclusion must be I have to give you a ticket. The premises are, uh, well, it's just all the other statements. So number one, if you're guilty of speeding, I have to give you a ticket. Number two, if you're guilty of speeding, you blink your eyes. And three, you blink your eyes. So kind of sounds convincing, right? But let's check it, like, let's be sure. So first, let's symbolize it. These are pretty simple statements to translate. Um, the number one is just the conditional, right? We got an if, we got a comma, um, and the antecedent and the consequent are both atomic. So you are guilty of speeding, we'll call that S. I have to give you a ticket, we'll call that T. Um, number two is also just a pretty simple conditional. If you are guilty of speeding, you blink your eyes. So the antecedent is the same. You're guilty of speeding. You blink your eyes. We'll call that B. And then three is you blink your eyes, also atomic. And four is atomic. I have to give you a ticket. We'll call that T. So now that we've translated it, the question is, is it valid, right? Can we do a proof? Well, let's see. Uh, we're trying to get T on its own. Right. If we look at line one, that's the only place T shows up. So if we had S on its own, we could uh, get T. The question is, where could we get S? Well, let's see. S shows up in line two. Right. Could we get it on its own from line two? It shows up as, as the antecedent of a conditional. Um, now, MT 
could give us not s, but not s isn't what we want, right? And we'd have to, even to do an empty, we'd need not p, and we don't have not p anywhere, right? Um, so is there a way to get t? Well, you know, stare at it for a while, try to do some moves, and you may find that you actually can't, right? Um, you can't actually solve this, right? This is an invalid argument. Um, in fact, it's sort of a case of, of what we call affirming the consequent, one of those formal fallacies. Um, but this is a situation you might get yourself into where you're, again, trying to check an argument for validity and you can't do the proof. So what do we conclude there? Well, we can't necessarily conclude that the argument is invalid, right? Because you never know, maybe I just wasn't clever enough, right? Um, but you certainly can't say that it's valid. Um, and I'm just telling you this one happens to be invalid. So this is the situation you'll find yourself in if you're trying to do a proof with an invalid argument, you'll just find you're not able to do it. I won't give you those on tests, right? If I ask you to do a proof on a test, um, it'll be a valid argument. Right? So again, you know, this might be invalid, right? But we just don't have, we certainly don't have rules of inference that would let us get where we want to get. Let's try one more for good measure because I just want to introduce a concept that's going to come up later. So suppose this is the argument. I love you, but if you vote for Jones, I don't love you. You voted for Jones, so Justin Bieber is better than the Beatles. So this should seem like a really weird argument, right? The conclusion, Justin Bieber is better than the Beatles, has nothing to do with any of the uh, um, premises, right? But we can still go ahead and, you know, symbolize it, right? So we say, okay, I love you, but if you vote for Jones, then I don't love you. That would be L and if J, then not L, right? Um, it's a conjunction, but the right conjunct is a conditional. Uh, two, I don't, uh, you voted for Jones, that's just J, right? that's just atomic. And then three, uh, uh, sorry, so that's, yeah, those are the two premises, right? And the conclusion is B, Justin Bieber is better than the Beatles. So could we complete this proof? Is the argument valid? Well, let's give it a shot. Um, we can get if J then not L on its own, right? On We can get uh, line three from line one simplification, right? Just simplify up that conjunction. Um, we can get then get not L from two and three modus ponens, right? We can also get L on its own, right? From line one with simplification. Now here's a little tricky move, right? With disjunction introduction or addition, right? I can say, from five, I can say L or B, right? So remember that rule says, if I know, you know, if I have something on one line, I can always put in a disjunction and throw whatever I want on the other side of the disjunction because disjunctions are real easy going, only one half of it has to be true. So if we're assuming L is true, then L or whatever the heck you want is true. And I'm gonna put B there, right? Because B is in my conclusion and I need B to come from somewhere. So now the question is, can I get rid of L? And I can because I have not L, right, on line four. Um, and that is a, uh, oh, that's a mistake on the slide, right? So it's, it should be four, six DS, not five, six DS. I should fix that. Um, so I, this argument is valid, right? I can get to B, but it seems weird because like I just pulled an irrelevant conclusion out of thin air, right? Well, the reason it worked is because there was a contradiction in there, right? Look, we we're able to get not L on line four and L on line five, right? And contradictions can't be true. You can't have contradictions. Well, in logic, what that amounts to is if you have a contradiction, you can prove anything you want, right? Which is in a logic -y way saying contradictions are, are meaningless, right? They just introduce nonsense into the world and anything follows, right? So we're gonna see uh, a method for doing proofs later that involves a contradiction Oh, they're called indirect truth, right? But I just want to, um, if you found this confusing and tricky, that's okay. I just wanted to throw in a, something new and something sort of like uh, interesting at the end, but I'm not going to uh, test you on that stuff, right? Um, okay, so again, practice your doing these proofs, right? Practice your homework, um, engage in the discussion, because this is a, a, a moment where students sometimes often have trouble, right? And they need a little help getting over the hump. So reach out to me, reach out to your fellow students, and I want you to get so you can do these proofs. All right, I'll see you soon.